Hi, welcome to this presentation on the storage improvements of Windows Server 2012. My name is Aidan Finn. I'm the technical sales lead for a value-added distributor in Ireland called Micro Warehouse. I'm an MVP in the virtual machine expertise, or Hyper-V. I blog on AidanFinn.com and I tweet on Joe underscore Elway. I'm one of the authors or contributing authors of a number of books, including Microsoft Private Cloud Computing, Mastering Hyper-V Deployment, and a few of us are working on a new book which will be out in early 2013 called Windows Server 2012 Hyper-V Inst Installation and Configuration Guide. There are a number of challenges that we're facing in terms of storage. The amount of data that we're dealing with is growing significantly. We need to support larger volumes that are flexible, especially for the private cloud. We also need to be able to use less space because disk is not cheap. Storage can be a huge investment. In fact, storage has become one of these things that we feel like we're being held hostage by. The storage vendors are locking us in, not just to them, but also to individual models of storage. And that can make our physical storage very expensive and also very inflexible, which can be a major problem. Some of the goals that Windows Server 2012 has in terms of storage are to consume less space, to use cheaper storage, and to offer us a new tier of storage that's scalable and continuously available. The first thing we've got is deduplication. And this is a feature that we can turn on for at rest data on selected data volumes. This is not for your boot volume. By default, it's going to dedupe files that have been at rest for five days. Now that's a configurable setting. The files it's going to dedupe have to meet a number of requirements. They have to be larger than 32K. They shouldn't be encrypted using something like EFS. And they can't have any extended attributes. After that, we can decide what types of files we want to exclude from deduplication. Some file types are already highly compressed, and trying to dedupe them would be a waste of time. The dedupe process itself is a low priority job, and it's not going to impact any applications that you've got running on the servers. The dedupe is built into Windows Server 2012, and you can turn it on for free. If you want to see what savings you're going to get, you can use a tool, tool called ddpeval.exe to determine how much space you're going to save. In Microsoft Estimates, then on a Virtual Machine Manager VHD library, we could save around 90% of disk space that that library is stored on. For our typical file servers, we could estimate that we're going to save around 50% of storage space. If you think about the size of your file server, that's a large amount of storage space, and that's a lot of money that you could be saving on an annual basis. We have a new type of virtual hard disk called VHDX. This is used by Hyper-V to store virtual machines, is used by Windows Server Backup as a backup target, and it, we can also boot physical servers from VHDX files instead of physical volumes. VHDX is 4K aligned, and that gives us great performance on native 4K disks, and 4K disks that reveal our sectors through 512 byte emulated sectors. VHDX scales out to 64 terabytes, which is a huge improvement over the 2040 gigs of VHD, or even the 2 terabytes of VMDK files. We can convert from VHD to VHDX and back again. Applications can store metadata in the VHDX file. VHDX also supports trim operations, which means we can reduce the amount of physical storage space that are used by these files when we remove data from within the files. It also supports a larger block size, which means that the growth of dynamic or differencing VHDX files will have better performance. Offloaded Data Transfer, or ODX, is a new feature that will speed up file operations on SANS that support the ODX protocol. And Some examples of this are where we want to copy files from one server to another, such as deploying virtual machines from a virtual machine manager library, creating fixed size VHDs, or performing a Hyper-V live storage migration. Without ODX, Server 1 would have to read the file from the SAN, then Server 1 would copy that file across the LAN to Server 2, which would in turn write that file back down to the SAN again. With ODX, Server 1 coordinates with Server 2 and with the SAN via tokens, and then the SAN performs the deployment operation of the file. That removes the LAN from the operation and makes the entire copy a much faster process. 
Windows Server 2012 introduces a new way of dealing with physical disks. Instead of buying more expensive RAID disks, we can use storage spaces to use cheaper storage, such as just a bunch of disks or JBOD. We pool these individual disks in the JBOD together in a storage pool. And if you want to think of that in SAN terminology, think of it as a disk group. From the storage pool, we can create individual storage spaces. Now, each of these will be a LUN. You can think of that as a virtual disk. Each storage space is thinly provisioned, and we can set a level of fault tolerance for the storage space. So it could have no parity. You can think of that as RAID 0. It could be mirrored. Think of that as RAID 10. Or it could have parity. And you could think of that as RAID 5. And this allows us to have very scalable storage at a low cost. In fact, you can even demonstrate this using USB disks on the back of a Windows 8 laptop. Windows Server 2012 gives us a new tier of storage based on Windows Server 2012 file services, and that's powered by SMB3. We can see a few examples where Windows Server 2012 file services is providing economic and highly performing storage. So in a web farm, we could have a number of Windows Server 2012 IIS web servers, and they could all store their data on the file server or file services in the back end instead of synchronizing the content across each of the web servers. SQL servers can even store their database and log files on a file share. And that can be done with massive performance without any sacrifices. In fact, you'll probably even boost performance with the right architecture. Hyper-V can even support storing virtual machines on our file shares. We can even build Hyper-V clusters using file shares to store our virtual machines. This is all made possible by a few significant features in SMB3. And the first of these is called SMB Multi-Channel. SMB Multi-Channel is built in and doesn't require any configuration. It will detect the ability to send multiple synchronized streams of file transfer across a single or multiple NICs. It can take advantage of an offload called RSS on high capacity NICs that makes a multi-threaded transfer instead of a single-threaded transfer. It can also detect if we have multiple NICs. So those could be teamed 1 gig NICs, non-teamed 1 gig NICs, or even multiple 10 gig NICs. By having multiple NICs and multiple streams over each of these NICs, we can have massive data transfer. Now this massive data transfer is going to have to be handled by the processor. And without any other work, it would have actually flooded the processor and harmed the application that was now getting the faster storage. SMB Direct deals with this by offloading or bypassing much of the networking stack. So we can have this huge data transfer without impacting the processor. RDMA is what makes this possible remote direct memory access. And this feature is on a number of different types of NICs, such as iWarp, Roki, or InfiniBand. Together, SMB Multichannel and SMB Direct provide huge levels of performance on Windows Server 2012 file services. And Microsoft and a number of partners demonstrated this at TechEd Europe 2012. In the first example, they achieved over 1 million IOPS using Windows Server 2012 Hyper-V Virtual Machine. That a storage on the back end was actually a storage appliance with 40 SSDs. This could have been achieved using four racks of fiber channel disk, but by using Windows Server 2012, they used less hardware, less storage space, and less electricity with a cheaper solution. And this also proved how Microsoft can virtualize massive OLTP workloads using Windows Server 2012 Hyper-V and Windows Server 2012 file services. In another example, a Microsoft partner demonstrated how they could transfer at 16 gigabytes per second over Windows Server 2012 file services. That's gigabytes, not gigabits. That's three DVDs per second with just four CPU utilization over InfiniBand networking and Windows Server 2012 file services. And this proves that SMB3 is an alternative to the traditional storage that we've been using over the years. 
There are a number of ways we can use Windows Server 2012, and here are a few examples using Hyper-B. Here we have a single file server, and it's used to store the virtual machines of a couple of non-clustered Hyper-V hosts. We can even build Hyper-V clusters using a single file server, but at this point we have a point of failure in that file server. There is a new file server cluster architecture called a scale-out file server. The traditional clustered file server was active passive, and there would be a, a brief moment of outage while the file share is transferred from one node to another. But the scale-out file server is scalable and continuously available. The storage on the back end is cheap JBOD, and we're using storage spaces to aggregate the disk and get levels of fault tolerance. The file share is active on all the nodes of the scale-out file server, and it's made continuously available through a clever witness process that runs on the nodes of the scale-out file server and on the SMB clients of the Hyper-V hosts. So if one of these nodes in the scale-out file server goes offline, there'll be a brief pause in IOPS before the IOPS is transferred to an alternative node in the scale-out file server. We can also use the scale-out file server to build Hyper-V clusters. There are two ways we can build a scale-out file server. One is to buy off-the-shelf JBOD and servers and attach them using SAS and build the scale-out file server cluster using Windows Server 2012. Alternatively, we can buy a cluster in the box. And that's an appliance that has maybe two or more blade servers, which will be our clustered nodes, and storage which is built into the appliance. And this possibly could be extended or expanded using disk trays. In the small medium enterprise, we can actually use this appliance to build an entire self-contained Hyper-V cluster by enabling Hyper-V on node 1 and node 2 without having to have additional servers as our Hyper-V hosts. Windows Server 2012 deals with a number of the challenges that we face with in storage. Deduplication reduces the amount of space that we use. VHDX gives us a scalable and highly performing virtual hard disk that we can use in the private cloud. ODX allows us to deploy and move files much more quickly on the SAM. We can also use cheaper storage. So storage spaces allows us to leverage JBOD instead of deploying and buying more expensive RAID storage. SMB3 allows us to take that cheaper storage and build scalable and continuously available and highly performing storage architectures which are an alternative tier of storage to the traditional SAM. And by abstracting our physical storage using file services, we can tilt the relationship with our storage vendors in our favor. If you'd like to learn more about Windows Server 2012 file services, I'd recommend the blog by Jose Barreto, a program manager on the Microsoft File Server team. I'd also recommend that you have a look at the sessions by the Microsoft File Server team at TechEd Europe 2012, where they delve into each of the topics that I've presented in this session in much more detail. I'm also blogging about these technologies from the Hyper-V perspective on AidenVen.com, and I'm tweeting about them on at Joel underscore Elway. Thank you for tuning into this session, and good luck with your deployment of Windows Server 2012.